Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first session uh, of the Battle of Ideas and the opening of the Battle for Our Minds Strand. And to introduce myself, I'm David Bowden, and aside from being your chair this morning, I'm the satellite coordinator at the Institute of Ideas, one of the organisers of the uh, festival and the convener of this strand. Now, normally when I introduce these topics, I try to uh, do an introduction to really sort of set the uh, issue within a certain context. Um, but with this session, I think pretty much the title says it all, and the fact that you're here and are interested in trying to unpick the title um, says a lot. I think some of you might have seen the headline this week of the story declaring that Oreos are as addictive as cocaine, uh, citing a study from neuroscientists at Connecticut, uh, Connecticut College that in a controlled study, lab rats found the chocolate biscuit as desirable as cocaine when offered the choice against rice cakes. Now, it's not a study that we're going to try and forensically pick apart over the next hour and a half. I suspect we probably wouldn't need an hour and a half to pick apart the various methodological problems with it. But it does seem to tap into um, uh, you know, very much a kind of cultural sentiment where the, the term addiction becomes used increasingly promiscuously, being able to apply to all manner of compulsive behaviours, from shopping to sex, internet pornography. And then there's the, the discussion really now that has kind of come up around uh, when you're discussing it, there's a, kind of, there's a notion of the, kind of the real addictions versus the, the uh, untrue addiction. But actually, when you start to delve into the, uh, the clinical debates on this topic, that it's, it's not quite straightforward as that. So to try and shed a little bit of light on the issue, I've amassed a, a large panel of um, uh, clinicians, writers, um, uh, academics, people who you know, engage in these discussions an awful lot and involved on the sharp end. So hopefully we can try and at least get a better understanding of what we mean by addiction by the end of it. Just to try and introduce you uh, to my panel, we have uh, Dr. Frankie Anderson, who is um, sat in the middle there, a, um, to my left, who is a hospital medicine trainee, who has recently started a master's in neuroscience at the Institute of Psychiatry, and is also co-organizer of the Sheffield Salon, which is a monthly discussion forum which meets, appropriately enough, in Sheffield, um, to discuss a lot of the issues that we look at in the Battle of Ideas. It was inspired by the Battle of Ideas, and they said that we want to do something similar in Sheffield, and they organized a a discussion on neuroscience and free will a couple of weeks ago, which had 150 plus people um, uh, at it, and it was a fantastic discussion. Would, well worth looking up on YouTube, by the way, um, since they've got recording up. Then we have sat to my immediate right, Dr. Henrietta Bowden Jones, uh, who is director of the National Problem Gambling Clinic and honorary senior lecturer in the Division of Brain Science at Imperial College. Then we have sat to my to my far left, uh, Dr. Michael Fitzpatrick, um, who's a GP and medical writer. Uh, he's written extensively on medical and scientific issues and is the author of books such as The Tyranny of Health and Defeating Autism, A Damaging Delusion. So to my immediate left, I have Dr. Sally Sattel, who's a psychiatrist and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, a lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine. We're delighted she's been able to fly over um, to join us this weekend to help launch her new book, Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience, which she'll also be speaking at a keynote session on um, tom tomorrow afternoon, I believe. And also, in her spare time, uh, she uh, helps out at a methadone clinic, um, just to, to make everyone sort of feel as if we're wasting our lives a little bit more. <laughs> Sally is, uh, writes extensively these debates and is involved in the sharp end. And last, but by no means least, we have Phil Withington to my uh, far right, who is a professor of early modern history at the University of Sheffield and co-editor of the journal Intoxication and Society. He may not see a straightforward, obvious uh, professor of... Um, uh, early modern history on a panel about what addiction means today, but I've, I've seen Phil speak on this issue before, and he has some, some fascinating uh, perspectives on that, but I'll let you make your own mind up. And one of the reasons I've done this panel today is I go to a lot of discussions around addiction. I often get very frustrated because what's interesting is that uh, everyone comes at addiction from a different angle. They have their own perspectives on it, and you can often spend quite a long time talking at cross-purposes. Um, so I thought I'd try and move us straight into the heart of the discussion by uh, dispensing with the kind of um, uh, longer speeches at the beginning uh, and to move kind of straight into sort of some of the core questions. But at the same time, I also do want to give them a couple of minutes to just try and set out their perspectives and give you a little bit of an indication of where they're coming from. Henrietta. Thank you very much, David. Um, well, I'd just like to say that although a lot of you in the audience will at some point want to raise issue about the reclassification in DSM-5, of um, addiction and the way we perceive it. Um, I, I would really like to, first of all, say that for 20 years I've been working with patients suffering from addiction. I've seen actually a couple of people here who are my ex-patients. 
Um, I've worked with homeless addicts, giving out methadone. I've worked in private clinics, dealing with 12-step movements. And I was, for many years, um, the psychiatrist who was uh, running the detox units for Kensington, Chelsea and Westminster, doing alcohol, drugs, etc. So I've got a good perspective in terms of the whole spectrum. And what I want to say today, I want to make this more personal in terms of the individual. Addiction is about distress and suffering. And when we try and think what makes all addictions link up to each other, why is a DSM-5 now putting all these addictions together, including gambling? Well, because distress and suffering bring them together. When you have um, let down your children by not being them, there for them emotionally or physically, when you've let down your parents by using up all their mortgage money, um, and losing their, your family home and their family home because you've spent the money on pathological gambling. When you've um, lost your friends because you've used them, you've borrowed money from them to buy drugs, um, or you've alienated them by removing yourself from your social circle. When you've uh, committed acts of domestic violence, which is something that unfortunately does happen sometimes when people are fighting about money, etc. When you've lost your marriage, then Whatever addiction it is, the fact is that you are sitting in a room, you're talking to others, and you're all sharing the same pain and suffering. And today, I really want you to focus not just on the individual, but as I said, on the children of addicts. I, uh, I would say that over half of the people I treat every week have had history of parents who had some form of addiction. And their suffering started extremely early, and in a way, the odds were against them from the start, and of course we can help, and of course we can help people be better parents, but I think it is something that I really care about. Um, I will be happy to talk about pathological gambling at any point in terms of why it's being uh, moved under addictions from impulse control disorder, but I think if we approach it from a personal perspective of the losses um, and the idea of doing something really against your will, doing something when it provides no pleasure anymore because you have gone way beyond that. I have patients who win money and are sick at the thought of having won the money because they know they'll have to be at those machines until all the money's gone. And that may be 18 to 20 hours later, but they know that money will be gone. Uh, and then chasing losses means they have to stay longer. So a lot of our patients, certainly at the National Problem Gambling Clinic, get no sleep because it's a constant cycle. Very similar in many ways to people who use stimulants and are on cycles of like those. Okay, Phil? Thanks very much. Uh, my um, perspective today is as a historian of intoxication rather than as a, a practitioner, someone involved with people. Um, obviously addiction is a, a fascinating topic, it goes to questions at the heart of the human condition, what it is to be human, why we do things um, and how we do them, the nature of the body and the mind. Uh, the relationship between the individual and the state, the nature of freedom, I think is very important. I'm just going to make three points. Uh, as a preface to what my contribution to the panel. And the first is simply that addiction is a very old word and idea. Um, it comes from the classical addictio, meaning to, to be a debtor assigned to the custody of the creditor, i.e. you became a slave. Uh, and once it was assimilated into the vernaculars, the European vernaculars in the 16th century, it quickly became a, a popular and commonplace term. So to Thomas Eliot in 1539 is divi uh, de defining it as to be fervently disposed and Edward Phillips a century later to give oneself to anything. Um, and it's used to describe, very quickly used to describe all sorts of fervencies, including gambling, in fact. And in a sense, the kind of compilation of the list um, today is very much in the tradition of this kind of promiscuity with which the term addiction was used from the 16th century. The second point I want to make very quickly is about the morality of the term, which is extremely complex. Um, in the early modern period, which I study, it would be, could be pejorative in itself, as it implied lack of self-control, moderation, and slippage into slavery. Slavery is a very important concept alongside addiction. Um, but you could nevertheless be addicted to good things, such as work um, or charity uh, and things like that. The real morality problem was the focus of your addiction. So if you were addicted to vice, then that was a double whammy in terms of your, your moral status as a person. And by the 18th century, addiction is becoming a shorthand for the um, fervency for vices as opposed to, to good things. The third point I want to point out is that from the 19th century, the late 19th century, the meaning of the word hasn't changed so much as the explanation as to why people are addicted has changed. And what we've seen 
and why this panel is constructed today, is that we've had a medicalization of the concept in terms of its explanatory power. And I just want to make three points about that. In terms of explanation, I think what you find from the late 19th century is whichever medical subdiscipline or discipline um, has institutional power or um, influence tends to have its kind of um, explanatory um, position on addiction uh, rarefied as, as a policy position. There's a very close relationship between institutional and um, power and policy, which doesn't necessarily reflect actually the, the epistemological truth of the explanation. The second point I'd make is that focusing, and this actually is um, endorsing Henrietta's point, focusing purely on the physiological, the neurological, the, the health issue can be naive and potentially dangerous for both the personal and the social body and that it obscures the, the vast complexity of social, cultural and political factors which also play into the issue of addiction and of course the positive kinds of values which are associated with the same kind of consumption such as intoxication, joyousness and etc. Um, so I think the medical has to be placed within this historical and this much wider social context if we're going to go further and be actually constructive in our approach. So the question is what, what is addiction? And if I had a say in one word, I'd call it, it's a behavior. And the, it's a behavior that there's largely consensus around. Uh, it's uh, encompassing three general qualities. One is that the addicted person has a intense desire to do something, use drugs, gamble, whatever. Uh, that there's difficulty quitting this behavior and that the behavior itself uh, generate some adverse consequences. Bad things happen because people are engaged repetitively in this behavior that's hard to stop and that they like to engage in and feel compelled to, feel compelled, which is different than are compelled. Um, but at its core, uh, addiction really is a, a voluntary behavior. But let me define voluntary because I certainly don't mean it's something that people can easily uh, take or leave, that's, that's certainly not the case. But I'm defining voluntary in a strict behavioral sense, which is to say a behavior, um, <clears throat> a behavior whose course can be influenced by foreseeable consequences. So that if I know that there is a, a sanction that, that might face me if I, uh, if I continue to use, or a, a reward, I can modify my behavior. Uh, so that I can avoid the aversive consequence or uh, be rewarded. And speaking of <laughs> Oreos, actually a colleague of mine has done um, fascinating work. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a long tradition of what's called contingency management work where you give committed methamphetamine addicts a choice of cash or, or methamphetamine in a uh, laboratory-like setting and they will take the cash. The point is, in certain contexts, they are capable of choice making and choice making that we would consider constructive. Uh, there's been a lot of emphasis, I, I think, um, un unhealthy on the brain, on the neural level of addiction. It's relevant because clearly drugs affect the brain and any behavior will <laughs> engage the brain on, its, on a uh, fundamental level. But the brain changes that occur in the context of addiction uh, do not affect a person's uh, capacity to respond to these contingencies. Um, the contingencies have to be uh, constructed in a certain way so that they have meaning to a person, but the brain changes which are, which are real, which exist, do not, do not influence this choice making, as opposed to the brain changes we see in a more traditional brain disorder, let's say like Alzheimer's. There, no matter how much you might incentivize someone to stop their dementia from worsening, it wouldn't matter because the kinds of brain changes that are characteristic of dementing illnesses do not allow a person to respond to incentives and contingen contingencies. And that is a very key element of addiction. There are, there are others um, uh, that we can talk about, but that is extremely key in terms of how we think about treatment, effective treatment, and also in terms of policy. Uh, finally, if we think too, if we, if we stay too much at the neurological level, we will also forget the fact that people use drugs for reasons. Drugs serve a purpose. People 
use, continue, and stop using drugs for reasons. And those reasons, while it's very hard to change one's behavior, I'm not minimizing that at all. One just doesn't say no. But those reasons are important. And if we think too much about the brain and not enough about the mind, we won't be thinking of those reasons either. Okay, Mike? I just wanted to say something about uh, the convergence of two key concepts in this discussion. Suggested actually by a chapter in Phil's book, Intoxication in Society. Chapter, there's a chapter called The Addicted Self, and there's a chapter called Nudge Policy. And I'd like to talk about the convergence between the concepts of addiction and the concepts of nudge, which seem to me to be at the heart of much of the current discussion. And the basic underlying concept is that so many of us are so far out of control that we need others to guide us through life. That's the basic underlying concept of addiction and nudge. The common thing that pulls them together is is a sense of a diminished capacity of the human subject. You know, Sally says a, a, a neglect of the role of the mind and a, an elevation of the role of the brain. In the concept of addiction, we see a remarkable ascendancy of the medical model over the social model, uh, over any sort of moral model uh, of addiction, which is the, the, the two uh, ways of looking at addiction have vied for over 200 years with one another, but in recent years, the, addict, the, the medical biological model has been very much in the ascendant. And at the core of that concept is the fragile, vulnerable individual who is the slave to toxic substances, to toxic activities, even to toxic relationships with other human beings. Uh, you know, we're familiar with how these concepts have stretched from alcohol to heroin to, uh, to uh, tobacco to gambling to sex to all sorts of other things. And indeed, in the a notion of codependent relationships extend to the argument that almost everybody uh, has addictive relationships with other people. And these sort of ideas which are based on the incapable subject have been, as people have alluded to, legitimised by neuroscience as the subject of Sally's excellent book on this question. But the origins actually, the, as Sally said, neuroscience doesn't really explain anything about uh, these sorts of uh, behaviours. But it, it has a powerful way of, in the contemporary world, the neuroscientific discourse legitimises a, a, a set of ideas whose origin actually lies outside, is not in the scientific world at all, but lie in the cultural devaluation of con the concept of individual autonomy, of the downplaying of the capacity of the individual person. And this is where addiction meets nudge, because the nudge notion, people will know, the, the nudge unit is now installed in, in the uh, Downing Street as a centre of government policy. Uh, the outcoming of, of a whole set of developments in evolutionary psychology, behavioural economics, it actually rolls back the central concept of some 300 years of enlightenment thinking, which has at its centre the notion of the rational individual subject. The notion that is the centre of our political and economic life, that in, in politics we have the citizen who can make decisions about different ideological and political alternatives and put them into effect in the world. The idea of, that in economic life we can act as rational uh, pursuers of our own self-interest, the, the uh, consumer in relation to the market. These are the basic ideas that are at the centre of uh, the whole modern uh, 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 development of modern society. Nudge brushes all that aside and replaces it. No, no, this uh, notion of a rational individual subject uh, is being greatly undermined by the discoveries of modern uh, neuroscience and evolutionary psychology. And instead, actually, what is at the root of uh, the, the, the centre of the modern world is that irrational, passive uh, uh, subject. In fact, that somebody who is more the object of external forces uh, in terms of uh, government policy, but in terms of advertising, the media, propaganda. The individual is the dupe of these uh, all sorts of unconscious and irrational uh, emotional forces rather than a conscious, mindful, self-determining, autonomous individual. And the, the, the problem with this person is that this, this uh, person makes bad choices in their lives in relation to politics, economics, health, and they need, therefore, some counter-manipulation in order that they will make positive choices. If you're familiar with this discourse in the world of public health, that uh, what they call the choice architecture must be set to encourage people to make positive choices, the right choices as determined by experts who are guided by the highest levels of 
scientific enlightenment and that the idea that people therefore need support and advice and guidance to get them through uh, life. So that's I think where addiction meets nudge in the common degradation of the idea of the human individual, the, the idea of the degraded subject which actually comes out of a much wider political and cultural crisis of modern society which devalues the whole sense of human agency and expresses uh, the, de the and this is reflected in the elevation of the, the body over the mind, the, the subconscious, the unconscious over the conscious, the uh, restriction of the role of conscious uh, uh, mindful activity over the direction. Sorry, I'm loath to interrupt you, Mike, but I do want to give us a little bit okay. of opportunity to... I uh, just want to good. sketch that rather pessimistic, <laughs> misanthropic reaction of Santa Cruz, who seems to me at the heart of this discourse, which is what we need to challenge. There we go. Frankie. Okay, Excellent. Good. Okay. Um, the complex nature of the question of addiction is illustrated by the fact that we're having a panel on it here. We won't be having one on the philosophical implications of venous thromboembolism or having a heart attack, because addiction gets at something about what it means to be human and to be in control of our actions. Normally the way this question is coached is to look from, it, um, from competing schools of neuroscientific versus social determinism, both of which have their problems. I would argue, as evidence of this, that addiction as a concept does exist and does have a biological basis to it. Um, for example, there is a drug used in Parkinson's disorder, Reprinol or Requip, um, which is its generic name, that causes some, causes some of the people who take it to act in an impulsive and compulsive manner, very much like addiction. I think that this does, not sh this does show that there must be some neurobiological basis for this behaviour that we know as addiction, because people are material beings and can't just float above their biology. It is also clearly true that certain social circumstances encourage people to prioritise drug or alcohol or any other aspect of things in life, particularly when there aren't fantastic opportunities to do anything else. Um, in my own practice, there is the revolving door of the heavy use of alcoholics who tend to improve because of changes in their life circumstances rather, rather than relentless detoxification programmes. To underline my point, um, research done at the Liver Ward uh, showed that one of the key predictors of if alcoholics were, went back to drinking post-treatment was if they went and stayed with their mum after discharge. Clearly, the fear of your mum's disapproval can be as big as a fear as a compulsion to drink for some people. But the question I would like to raise is whether or not it matters what the underlying cause of addiction is. And are we in danger of elevating medical treatment, although more morally acceptable to me as a doctor, um, but leaving us with the same sense of denial and autonomy and human dignity as the traditional moral framework. Okay, thank you. I, hope, I think that's woken you all up this morning, uh, hopefully, uh, and now thoroughly in the heart of the debate. I'm just going to try and throw out a couple of questions for us to discuss on the panel, and I know that you probably want to respond to uh, some of what has already been said, but I, mean, I sort of alluded to it in my introduction, is that there is a sort of sense of, you know, particularly people understand things that you were addicted to, Substances and people sort of understand. You know, you can be addicted to heroin. Increasingly, nicotine is. You know, I'm. You know, I'm told I'm a smoker. I'm addicted to it. I need help to to get off it. Alcohol. There's a kind of chemical dependency, substance dependency, and then there are the kind of the more behavioural addictions, which are the ones that people tend to be a little bit more cynical about. You know, the, the idea, you know, partly because they're related to to vices. You know, that, that you know, if you if you, you know, if you if you have a lot of promiscuous sex, then you're a sex addict. If you happen to sit around all day watching internet pornography, you're a, pornography addict as opposed to somebody who's cho choosing to do that. Um, is that. Is that a helpful distinction to be making? Has that really shifted too much? Can you be theoretically addicted to anything or does it, is there something inherent about the substances or behaviours you take part in? Henriette. I think it, the last point made was, uh, was something that I, I would have added if I'd had more than two minutes at my disposal at the beginning uh, in, during introductions. One, one of the things that I make sure I do, and not just me but all my colleagues do, is when we, when we have someone in, in the room with us for the first time and we're conducting what we call a, a full psychiatric assessment, is to really delve deep into this person's early, early years, early lives early life, and um, there are certain things we look for, and I'll just list a few of them, just to give you an idea, because if I go through and I meet with some, one of my patients, be they alcoholic, drug addict, gambler, etc., and I don't find any of these, then the situation gets 
a lot more intellectually challenging and interesting because most of the time some of these are there. So uh, we look for um, early adverse life events and these could be um, separations uh, in early years from, from, from the family, from parents and the family due to illness. In the old days, there would be separations of six months, four months. People, children would be placed in hospitals with no particular explanation. So we see that quite a lot. Um, deaths of, 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 close, uh, of close family members, um, uh, divorces, separations that were in some way complex for the family dynamics, uh, emotional, sexual, or physical abuse uh, during childhood, um, a parental addiction, um, the illness of a sibling. You'd never think, but you have no idea how many of my patients with addictions have had a sibling who for some reason, because of a serious medical illness, caused the parental attention to be diverted from the development of the patient, him, him or herself. Um, there's also bullying at school. Um, a large number of people began feeling insecure and their sort of safe world fell apart through uh, what may have been bullying because of already pre-existing problems. And then we look at comorbidity as well, what we call other existence of other mental illnesses within that person. Sometimes low mood in the, fam in the, in the person uh, in, in teenage years, or sometimes at primary school, and maybe sometimes because of our biological inheritance, because uh, a, a, a parent or a grandparent already suffered from it. So you have a weaker child in the context of a school environment. So I just want to say, going back to, you know, are all addicts the same? Well, the etiological factors very often are shared, and this is what I've just been talking about. And of course, there are lots of other things that impact, and we can talk about, you know, ventral, medial, prefrontal cortex, if anyone wants to, I'd love to talk about that. But the fact is that there are things that have happened as well that may make you more vulnerable, and you may need a more, bit more nurturing to bring up your levels of resilience. And I think today, the word resilience is a really important one. Sally, and I want to get in, and then does Michael... Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Well, your qu question was, uh, do we conflate things when, uh, should we ex use um, behavioral addictions interchangeably uh, with um, substance addictions? And, um, you know, that's, that's a good question. I think that, I think that um, behavioral addictions are, are easier to trivialize because of the examples you gave. You know, if somebody is uh, right, watching internet too much, you know, they have an addiction. Although, so that's where uh, we can trivialize that versus usually with substances, it goes the other way where people will minimize the, the amount they're using and it's more problematic than they'll often admit. On the other hand, an enormous amount of damage can come from in, uh, excessive engagement in these behaviors or in using cocaine. So in that way, there's, there's a similarity. Where, where I, what, what concerns me the most really is, is uh, by codifying these diagnoses, which we have to do for clinical practice, there's no question about that, I, and I have no problem with it, uh, but is, is when this migrates into the forensic setting and in the courtroom and the legal status of these uh, diagnoses then and how they're used in the service of either uh, you know, excuse or mitigation. Um, and I think that's problematic no matter what the addiction is. Mike? Yeah, I think there's an interesting um, moment in the uh, discussion of uh, tobacco, cigarette uh, smoking, uh, around about the end of the 80s, early 90s, when the, uh, the early days, um, when they first became apparent of a link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, uh, there was a, uh, and that was promoted to public health people, it was a, and a, there was a substantial decline in the rate of smoking, and uh, very many millions of people gave it up. Uh, obviously, there was a significant proportion of people still smoking, and the, the, the way in which the issue was presented was shifted from the idea of cigarette smoking being a bad habit to suddenly there was a sort of scientific discourse today, which actually wasn't new, it had been around forever, but it became suddenly the dominant view, which it wasn't, cigarette smoking wasn't a bad habit, it was to do with nicotine dependency and addiction to nicotine, and the idea was, and the, the idea then was what people needed was nicotine replacement <coughs> therapy, which then became uh, available in various forms, which people are now familiar with. But it's interesting to know, this is, it was a new way of pre presenting the whole problem of, of so-called addiction to smoking. 
from being a bad habit to being a chemical dependency. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, was a, was a, a significant shift and it, it redefined something which was considered a bad habit to being uh, 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 in terms of addiction. Now, what was also interesting about this was that actually it was in terms of uh, people's capacity to give up, uh, much more successful was the propaganda about just drawing to people's attention the dangers of smoking. The introduction of nicotine replacement therapy and indeed other more medical sorts of treatment for addiction have proved to be much less successful in terms of actually getting uh, the, the rate of, depend, rate of uh, consumption down. Uh, people then made the argument that cigarette smoking is, you know, uh, nicotine is even more addictive than heroin, which is actually, you know, an interesting argument looking back to heroin because if millions of people have managed to give up cigarette smoking as a bad habit without any medical treatment, then maybe that also applied to heroin. Which actually then other people can, but actually this does apply to heroin. Lots of people just stop uh, using heroin, and there are various examples of it. The, the GIs coming back from Vietnam who all gave up using heroin without the vast majority without using treatment. So the and people who stop using uh, opiates for, for in the, when they're using it for medical treatment, which doesn't seem to occasion the great withdrawal problems and everything else that have required all sorts of medical treatments. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there is in fact a lot of good news here, that most people are quite capable of dealing with toxic substances and, and, and stopping them without a lot of medical medicalization or medical intervention in them. And that the idea of medical dependency or, or chemical dependency is not as persuasive as it might be if you look at the actual broad reality of people's experience of dealing with these uh, problems. The, the other cautionary note I would like to strike here, I think we are talking about, to some extent, different problems here. I'm actually concer can really concerned about the wide way in which the concepts of addiction are used in relation to society as a whole. I think there are particular issues about how you help the tiny minority of people who have very particular problems of dealing with addiction. There's two, two related but separate issues, I think, okay. yeah, uh, that we discuss separately. Phil and then Frankie. Oh. Cool. Thanks. Um, I just think it's helpful possibly to think of, um, of separating some of the issues that we're talking about um, conceptually. I mean, in terms of the semantics of addiction, obviously you can be addicted to anything if you're fervently disposed um, to gambling or to heroin or to pornography. That is on a par and that is entirely consistent with uses of the term as, they've, um, as it's come down to us from classical culture. But if you then think about the, um, the nature of the focus of addiction and the explanations of to why it's addictive, um, for example, the difference between gambling and, um, and nicotine, uh, then, then that's a different set of issues because you have um, different epistemologies and understandings of the nature of that addiction um, and the way it interacts with the body and the self and so on. But I think the third point, and I think what I was getting from Henrietta's um, when you were talking is the consequences of, of this, whatever kind of addiction it is as well, and the social um, um, settings in which the addicted person has to operate. And I think that's a third set of factors which isn't necessarily helpful to conflate with the second set of factors and the first set of factors. And I think when you do conflate them, you, you get into real problems in terms of certainly legislative um, attitudes and the way in which the society deals with problems and not problems. And it also encourages social discrimination as well, I think there's, there's a real danger of that within that conflation. Yeah. I would echo Mike's point that there is a big difference between having a couple of drinks on a Saturday night and using the parlance of psychology and saying, oh, I'm addicted to this, or I'm addicted, which is now becoming far more mainstream to hear psychological or psychiatric language used outside of um, of psychiatric settings, so people are addicted to candy crutch, or they're, you know, I'm feeling depressed, I feel a bit fed up. So I would echo that conflation, you know, don't conflate what is an addiction and what is a bad habit. In terms of uh, substance abuse and behavioural problems, I think possibly coming from a medical perspective, um, the thing that we, we don't discuss is the, the kind of social consequences of something like alcohol or heroin addiction, which have wider effects on the body as opposed to just in psychological um, terminology and how we deal with that as a society. Um, I would argue that there is an increased amount of problem drinking. Um, although I don't think nudge is the way forward, there needs to be a discussion about how we do deal with 
people drinking more and more often. I mean, so both, both Phil and Mike have talked about the way in which there's a kind of move from moralisation to medicalisation. But the question that I'd, I'd want to ask is, has, has medicalisation actually completely demoralised the debates, um, demoralised um, the discussion, or has it shifted the territory? Because there is a sort of, because behind a lot of the kind of rise of the addictive uh, uh, term sort of seems to be the, it's okay if you accept that you're an addict to something. It's okay, it's kind of accept, socially acceptable to engage in certain behaviours if you can excuse yourself through addiction. I mean, that seems to me at least how the term gets used, but I don't, I don't know whether that's Henrietta. I'm glad you, you raised the, uh, the, the moral issue. One of the pieces of research we did recently at, at the gambling clinic that I run, by the way, we, we, we are the biggest in Europe. We, we've, see, we, we've had over 2,000 referrals since I started this five years ago. So, you know, there are half a million pathological gamblers at any one time in this country. It's not a, it's not a small, small issue. But one of the pieces of research we did recently was to... Um, ask every single person who came through our doors when we were doing our assessment, it wasn't just, do you have a forensic history, which is what sometimes people get asked, tick the box, no, they haven't been arrested. This is, have you ever committed any illegal acts to fund your gambling? Ever, whether it's taking your mother's credit card or stealing your grandmother's ring and selling it. And what we found, to our horror, was that 84% of our patients, 84% had... And these are people with no criminal convictions, no um, uh, history of any illegal acts prior to becoming pathological gamblers. These are people who had crossed that moral line, been driven to crossing it by their diagnosis, by their illness. And this is why I do believe that uh, pathological gambling and other behavioral addictions uh, can be united in the sense of being as serious as um, our phys physical addictions. I think in terms of um, shifting the attention away from self-determinism and individual responsibility and will, as um, was being said earlier, um, there is a demoralization demoral um, that takes place because you're obviously making someone um, um, the function of their physiology and biology. But at the same time, I think um, if you look at it historically, uh, the kind of medical evangelists of the 20th and 21st century have essentially taken up the same moral batons in terms of their focus on vices um, and why people shouldn't engage in certain vice-like activity. There was very much present um, in the rhetoric of religious evangelicals uh, before the 19th century. So there's a very strong moral continuity and it's just basically been re-articulated um, and legitimated through medicine rather than the church. Yeah, I had an experience. I recently retired from general practice, and one of, in the last few months of my practice, I wrote my first prescription for methadone for a patient going into a sheltered uh, accommodation in a, in a basically an old people's home. And I, I must say, I, I had this sort of image of him shuffling on the corridor with his bottle of methadone next to his Zimmer frame, and thinking to myself, is treatment really better than punishment as a model of dealing with the problems of addiction, uh, you know, that in a way you have to ask the question, does it work, you know, that somebody is using a, this, this, the, this rather stupefying drug for, for continuously for 30 years, you know, the, the object of these sort of treatments was originally, uh, as originally started, was to achieve, to get people off the drugs, to achieve abstinence, that's been entirely thrown out the window, if you look at the, if you ask the question, does it work in, t in those terms, then obviously it doesn't, and the statistics of the National Treatment Agency bear that out. In, in this, if you look specifically in relation to uh, uh, the, the methadone issue, but also I think more importantly than the pragmatic question, you could ask that about other treatment options too. Is is it any more humane uh, as a way of treating that? I come to see detox and rehab as a sort of ball and chain of the therapeutic society that in a sense that they uh, become a, a, a life sentence for people that uh, not only uh, condemn them to these forms, either uh, continuing forms of, like in the AA model of uh, group therapy for life, or other sorts of therapeutic relations, or the taking of some sort of medications for life, but also the loss of dignity that that involves, the sense of diminished self that's at the centre of that, the idea that they are uh, 
branded as the drug addict, as the uh, damaged person, as the person who is incapable of, of leading their life. And that sort of loss of, uh, the loss of respect for human dignity, the loss of autonomy of the human subject that's at the centre of that discourse, seems to me to be profoundly damaging uh, to the uh, uh, welfare and, and uh, uh, well-being of the individual. Okay, Sally, then Frankie, then I'm going to go out to the audience. You know, from a treatment standpoint, this, you know, the medical versus moral stance is, uh, I, I think, a false dichotomy. I'm guessing you do as well. Uh, and actually, I see them operating well synergistically. Um, if, from the medical standpoint, when I think of medical, I, I don't think of, I don't think of addiction as a classic disease because, again, the, the disease concept implies involuntariness. But when I say that the synergism between medical and moral makes a lot of sense, by medical there I mean the uh, availability of care for people and the care itself and anyone who comes into it should not be stigmatized. Their behavior as an addict, sure, it should be stigmatized. No one stigmatizes it more than addicts them themselves. They come in because so often they're ashamed. Um, and I also think we can use pharmaceuticals. I work in a methadone clinic, for heaven's sake, so I have nothing against that. It's probably the best, um, Michael, you know, is, it's not great, but it's probably, probably the best pharmaceutical we even have for treating drug addiction, if you want to go that route. Um, and when I say moral, you know, referring to scolding, I mean, as I said, again, uh, there's enough self-loathing that goes on among, within the people who who find themselves addicted, but moral in terms of, again, the choice-making capacity that I mentioned earlier, and the importance of accountability. I mean, we do that in our methadone clinic from something as simple as, you know, you give clean urines and you get more take-homes. I don't know what they do here, but take-homes means you get to take your methadone home so you don't have to come to the clinic every day. It's a little bit of a perk. All the way to very enlightened uh, criminal justice programs that are diversions from jail. So if you're a nonviolent addict offender, maybe you shoplifted or something, um, instead of going to jail or being adjudicated in the traditional way, you'll enter a supervised treatment program that's closely monitored if you do well. Um, you will, actually they'll clear your record. Um, if you don't do so well, there's, there's what's called graduated sanction. So it's not like they come down on you and then throw you in jail. Or it's, it's, it's a small sanction. So you might have to spend a night in jail or do something that's aversive, but the clock doesn't reset. You go back to the treatment program and, and try again. And it's, it's, uh, the success rates are, are impressive. But that's a coming together of the moral and medical models that works pretty well. Just, just two brief points, actually, particularly I found, um, you know, very interesting what Dr. Bowden Jones had to say. The first is, it, 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 do you think that addiction is a form of compulsive obsessive disorder? And I say that because of people switching addictions, they might start in childhood with behavioral things and sugar, etc., etc., and then graduate. And then the related second point is really about uh, cross addiction and switching addictions, which also comes on, I think, to something Dr. Sattel said about uh, methamphetamine addicts taking the cash. And uh, I, I think the phrase is sometimes used the redeeming power of an alternative affection. In other words, that people become obsessed with something else. Um, I knew someone in, in treatment who was uh, given the yellow card for going to the gym and the treatment center uh, three times a day. When it got up to five, he was thrown out. Um, so it's the question of substitute. And it's quite frankly, maybe a case of just finding a healthy substitute. I've been a social worker all my life. The factors you identified as being prominent in your patients could, I think, be said to be present in most socially dysfunctional people, that is, people who experienced early loss, exposure to violence and abuse, and so on and so forth. Um, what is it that makes people turn specifically to gambling, then, given this commonality of early problematic histories? It was a question about the same point, really, um, although my perception of things is quite different, because... When you were speaking, Henrietta, and saying these things about early experience... Yes, I can um, see you now. I mean, as far as I can see, if you ask most people enough about their early experience, you might as well come up with a conclusion that we're all theoretical addicts. I mean, you know, parents splitting up when you were a kid, having one of your siblings not very well, so your mum being more bothered about them than you. I mean, it's just called...
natural family life. It's not pathological, it's not abnormal. Um, in fact, it's the way most of us grow up. And the thing that I find interesting about it, reflected in, in the other commentary, is just how widespread and commonplace the argument is to explain just about everything. You know, if you want to find any explanation for anything that's now wrong in society, whether it's kids not doing very well at school, whether it's criminality, whether it's drug addiction, there is now a one-size-fits-all explanation, which is basically blame your parents. It all goes back to what your parents did. And it seems to me it's time you absolutely nothing about addiction and explanation for everything, but tells you about a present cultural activity to try and basically say to us, echoing the points that Mike made, um, that we're basically victims of our past and to do nothing to control our future. Um, and it seems to me to be a very odd and peculiar way of, of trying to understand anything. So, yeah, theoretically speaking, we are all addicts. Every one of us, we're, ad we're addicts to dopamine. That's essentially how your motivation and reward system works. We all have one key addiction, neurologically speaking. We love dopamine, we'll do most anything for it. But then, just to answer this, 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 this idea, and I'd be very interested in the comments on this point, that uh, we have an increasing understanding of what it is that compels our behavior. We're increasingly able to look at genetic correlates and upbringing and so on, and it's true. Every year and every decade, we understand more and more and more about the antecedent causes which result in, in our behavior. And, and, and so it seems at one point in history, we could say this is demons possessing someone, then we can say it's an upbringing, then we can say it's a tumor, then we can say it's a genetic lineage. And the responsibility is pushed ever further into the past, which I think is a huge moral dilemma. That the person we excuse today and say, well, this person had choice, but this person is to blame. 10 years later, we say, well, actually, there was less choice. We understand the antecedents further. And it's a huge, I think, moral conundrum. I'd be particularly interested in Sally's comments on that. Thank you. I feel I've got a bit of a shopping list to, to re re reply to. First of all, I'd like to extend my sincere apologies to you personally. I think, I, I think you may have mi misunderstood me because in a short space of time I may have appeared to trivialize uh, something. Um, what I was talking about were quite extreme experiences uh, that I certainly do not see in the population at large on a regular basis. I'm talking about things that were perceived as being extremely traumatic. It's not so much uh, that a separation took place, but the way in which it affected negatively that particular individual. So do so 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 do accept my apologies. Of course, you know, um, you know, half of half of the people around here probably have separated parents, divorced parents. So that's not the issue at all. It's more about uh, experiences that were lived in a certain way by that individual. And I think that goes back to we really need to listen to our patients. They don't fit boxes. You know, you need to really understand what their narrative is and what their journey was like and where did it go wrong for them to now need to do something that is so adverse in terms of consequences in their lives, in terms of harming them and their loved ones. Something happened and we need, I feel, you know, almost like a detective. I need to work out what it is that happened to change course for someone who may have had a good life or an okay life and suddenly become, became destructive. So, so I hope you, you accept my apologies. I want to just pick up on the question which I loved on what makes a problem gambler. I've got about six things I'd like to tell you about, but I'll do it briefly. Um, we know for a fact from the British Gambling Prevalence Survey of 2007, 2010, the year 2000, having a parent who is a gambler is one of the risk factors. Having a parent who is a pathological gambler is a risk factor in two ways. One, because you've seen them playing. I have patients who were left on their own at the age of six, walking around arcades while, whilst their parents were gambling or walking around shopping malls waiting for their mothers to come out of a casino. Um, uh, but also there's biological loading. There is a genetic predisposition, like, just like in all addiction, you know, 40% heritability is a fact, it's not invented. And I think we need to take that into account. There are people who I see who are students who at the age of 19 have gambled away all their university grant. They don't know why they did it. There's nothing coming up in the personal history that I can pick up. And then I find out their grandfather lost all the family money. And then you know that actually there is, you know, genes do mean something. Um, and early big wins are really important. If you have none of the above things that I've mentioned, but you go with a friend and you play together, you put 10 pounds and you win, and you win 200, 
that is a really strong, unfortunately, vulnerability factor. And you know what? If your friend wins and you don't, it still matters. It still has an impact in terms of potentially turning you into someone who, become, who gets a problem. And a lot, I would say maybe a third of our patients have experienced an early big win in their gambling career. Um, you talked about dopaminergic reward pathways. Undoubtedly, there are um, uh, abnormal findings in many of our patients. And if I can just tell you one thing, what we've done is we've looked at, uh, we, we've done research looking at the way people respond to near misses. Near misses mean that you know, you've got two apples and a banana. Well, if I get two apples and a banana, to me, that's just like I didn't win. But if you're predisposed to problem gambling, two apples and a banana is a near win. And although you win nothing, in your head, you've had a rush of dopamine, you've got very, very excited, your heart rate is up, you're sweating, and you're finding this extremely rewarding. And I think that's important from a neuroscientific perspective. It's all interesting points. I think you end up with kind of neuroscience defending it from neuroscientists. Um, because there is an, a, a large proportion of research that is done. The extrapolations from that research is very difficult to know what is significant and what isn't. Um, particularly in an era where we're not exactly sure what's normal. And then even if you do find that, that um, there is an aberration in your pathway showing X, Y and Z, the question then lies as to whether or not that is significant or not. Um, and really what does that show apart from the fact that part of your brain isn't functioning correctly or is over-functioning. So I would try and move away from the concept of neurodeterminism to explain something as socially involved as addiction. The gentleman with the, the cat, you said, I think, uh, what won't we do, or we'll do almost anything for dopamine. And, um, but, you know, we won't. And <clears throat> you see this, uh, I mean, most of us don't, simply because most people don't become addicts. And, and I'm talking about traditional, <laughs> conventional type of of addicts. Um, and what happens is uh, two things. First, uh, forget the people who never become addicts, but there are people who are on their way to becoming addicts. And most people, and I have good epidemiologic sources if, if folks want to follow up on this, the, the natural history is that most people um, stop using on their own. Um, now, within maybe within the first 10 years of you. Now that's a lot of years and a lot can happen. You can get HIV, you can overdose, you can get in a, a lot of trouble during those 10 years. So I, my, I don't recommend sitting there waiting, <laughs> thinking, well, it just will be over, even though statistically it, it will be. No, you want to intervene as soon as possible, no question about that. But the point is that we hear so much, or at least in the U.S., how addiction, this has become a mantra, chronic relapsing brain disease. Well, put the brain disease part aside because I, I just have problems with reifying it that way, again, with the emphasis on the brain. But, um, but even the, the chronicity part is, is not true. Most people stop on their own, um, and they stop within a number of years, usually before they're 30. The people who tend to go on are people who usually have comorbid illnesses, depression or anxiety. Um, the other thing is that uh, when a person is in a situation like um, Henrietta's describing, you know, it, at the casino or in the middle of a crack binge or in the midst of heroin withdrawal, that's not the time they're going to walk away. That's not even the time they're in a position to walk away. But uh, the average person who does decide to stop um, is you often, usually respond, I think, well, I can hardly think of a situation otherwise, frankly, but responding to either self-disgust with themselves and their situation or pressure from a, from a family member. And, um, and these sort of self-appraisals uh, play a huge role in a person's decision to stop. But the decision is not made while they're, again, in the throes of withdrawal or, uh, you know, in front of the machine. Um, it stops during these lucid periods, which drug addicts actually have a, a lot of. We tend to, I think, think of these cinematic representations where, where uh, you know, an alcoholic is drinking all the time, or someone's constantly nodding out if they're, but they're, I mean, most of our patients work. No, they don't get paid taxes or anything, you know, it's like under the table, but the point is they're purposeful and they have jobs and they're productive in a way. Um, a lot of hours in the day 
for most folks, or, 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 and or for a good portion of, let's say, the year, because people do wax and wane in terms of their cycles of heaviness of views, are spent in perfectly lucid moments where they make all kinds of decisions. So they get a new job, do they kick their freeloading cousin off the couch? I mean, a million things. And some of those decisions could be, this is the day I go to AA, this is the day I go to a treatment program, or this is the day I stop. And most people, as I said, will do, do stop on their own. Um, so dopamine isn't everything. OK. Mike? Well, I very much agree with that. We, we, you know, the, we all love dopamine. Uh, if we all love dopamine, then that tells us exactly nothing about why some particular people have, have problems with addictions. Uh, and I think that's, the, in a way, sums up the whole problem of uh, the contribution of science and uh, in its different forms, genetics, neuroscience, neurotransmitters, MRI scans, which are invoked to uh, show that we understand that these problems better. I, I can't see any... Uh, way in which those uh, you know, there's some interesting uh, research and interesting power. it seems to me provides nothing useful in terms of dealing with that, the problems that these uh, issues throw up in, in society and other than to generate all sorts of fantasies that uh, there's some sort of magic fix that's going to emerge from it, some sort of drug treatment for it or vaccine for cocaine use which are, you know, uh, 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 projects that are being pursued but, you know, if we stand back from it, what we all know that there's a human weakness for intoxicants. It's a, uh, uh, you know, well, you know, we all, we've all, we've seen it exist through history, it exists through all our own lives. We also know that some people use these things in, in compulsive and destructive ways. That's also very familiar. We know, as Sally said, most people deal with it. People come through it uh, uh, in, in one way and another. And, but we live at a peculiar historical moment where the scale of people's capacity to deal with it is being radically downplayed and there's a great exaggeration, it seems, to an expansion of the scale of the problem to legitimise a much wider scale of therapeutic intervention from the state and various professional agencies purporting to help and guide people through dealing with the problems on a scale that are greatly exaggerated. And what I'm pulling back from it, trying to look at it in a wider social thing, to recognise actually people don't need doctors to deal with these problems. Doctors actually don't know, and the, the neuroscientists don't know anything about, doctors actually don't know anything about uh, uh, how to deal with these problems in any, uh, medical expertise has very little value in terms of dealing with these problems. And I, people equally don't need nudging by, as in the way I said at the beginning, I don't think there's any uh, uh, evidence of any psychological expertise that's any help. You know, uh, no doubt, the vast majority of people can deal with these problems. There's no doubt, equally, there's a small proportion of people who have problems and need some help with it. I'm at a disadvantage here in, in this uh, kind of gathering because whereas most people have seemed to me to have a very strong and clear conviction that they know what is helpful for, the, for people with these problems, I actually don't know. After 30 years of medical practice, I have to make that confession. I do not know what the most effective way of dealing with these problems is. But what I am suspicious of is interventions which make the problem worse. And I've seen a lot of those in my medical career. And I'm particularly suspicious of the morbid embrace that seems to exist between the diminished self of the addict and the enhanced self of the therapist marching together with a bottle of methadone into the old people's home. Um, I was also a bit perturbed by the idea that we understand about behaviour more every year. And, I mean, if you think about capitalism, capitalism works by inventing new things to do things which we can do already with old things um, to give the people who invent them money. And I do think we're going through a profound period of medical capitalism at the moment where um, different subdisciplines are making kind of claims to have discovered the gene or discovered the, the hormone or so on which explains behaviour when they don't. They know very little at all. Um, and, um, and I think that's reflected in that you, well, one decade to the next you have a kind of um, predominant paradigm um, that people are referring to. But I think to the question over there, I actually don't necessarily think you misunderstood what Henrietta was saying, and I sympathise entirely with what you're doing, because I think Henrietta's um, explanation of, of the therapy shows this kind of real lack of knowledge about why people do what they do, in terms of, you know, you can refer to dopamine, you can refer to a gene, you can talk about family history, but ultimately this is all very imprecise, and it, it isn't knowledge in a kind of meaningful sense. But I think the third point I would make in relation to that is that what it does do um, it distracts from the social and economic contexts in which the consequences of behaviour and the way in which behaviour affects other people um, 
actually exist and, and they're neglected because we're looking for the, the key to behavior um, and rather than being reformed themselves. And I think this really does bring in the difference between affluent, successful people who have an addiction and poor people who don't and who are vulnerable therefore. And I think there should be more attention paid to the social and the economic, um, it, not at the expense of trying to work out behavior, but certainly giving that as equal um, uh, attention. I mean, I just want to put the final nail in the neurodeterminist coffin because it's amazing, this beast. It keeps on being, you know, it's a bit like this Putin. You shot him, he kept running. You threw him in the ice, he popped out. You gave him an arsenic cake, he asked for a second helping. And neurodeterminism is the same indestructible beast. First of all, there are deep problems. There are conceptual problems. Dopaminergic pathways are supposed to explain the pleasure that we get from masturbation, from listening to an opera, or from reflecting on a life well led. They're actually quite different things. <laughs> for, for some people, anyway. So there's conceptual problems. There are empirical problems. Anybody who believes that there is such a science as social neuroscience should read two papers. Ed Vol's paper, uh, published in um, 2009, which was a meta-analysis, along with some serious characters, of most of the statistics in social neuroscience, and they don't stand up to the most, as it were, languid gaze. But even more damaging was a paper published in Science, which is the top science journal, a journal by Catherine Button and colleagues in May of this year, which looked at the very, very poor statistical associations. And it is not at all surprising. You wouldn't expect conceptually ill-defined items to do anything other than have very low correlation levels. But I want to relate that to something very important that Mike has said, which is this is part of a huge intellectual trend of pessimism, away from the notion that we are conscious agents the fundamental enlightenment notion that we are independent points of departure to the idea that we are just conduits for forces, either biological forces or social forces. And I think that is deeply dangerous. And that's why, that's why this discussion is even more important than, addictive, than addiction. And I would say this discussion itself is somewhat addictive for that reason. I don't vote for a minute that um, a lot of people have suffered serious abuse, but I do have a problem with, with the concept of it. Because um, I do think it's important to bear in mind that if memory is a replay, like a, a video or a, a DVD, and so if memory is as much about this present as it is about the past, so your, your present mental state influences how you remember past experiences. And if I do think we're, we're getting a sort of trend today where past abuse is being seen as the cause of so many things. Uh, and I, an example that, that I'll use is slightly maybe not related to it. A couple of years ago, I was charting the psychiatric user survivor movements and their arguments, etc., etc. And in the early days, a lot of their arguments for the cause of their psychotic uh, symptoms was to do with issues around class, structural issues, etc., etc. As reflective of wider society, as those issues started to get hold less coherence, now even within the user survivor movement. Most of the time you'll hear psychotic phenomena blamed on past abuse. I think another example you see that is Pete Townsend said that he couldn't remember why he, was do why he was downloading child pornography, but he thinks it was because he was abused as a child. And I think we're, we're, we're living in, in a time where we're looking for simple causes rather than more complex explanations of social you. phenomena. More an observation, I noticed that the panel uh, occasionally seems to use different words than addiction when talking about various types of what being described as problematic behaviour. And uh, so my first question is, is, is there a useful way of, of classifying or categorising various types of addiction? And you know, can they be mapped in a useful way? We talk about um, chemical, we talk about behavioural, but are there also different sort of levels, you know, like a sort of, I don't know, earthquake type scale of some sort. The uh, second question, perhaps a bit cheeky, is um, are the practicing doctors ever thought that they might be addicted to treating <laughs> <laughs> Um, I suppose I just wanted to uh, comment on the sort of um, practical implications of this, uh, of what Mike was talking about, because I work with young people now for the last 30 years, and I suppose what it really, the implications of this individually is that really young people are almost less, more or less, given no choice, that you know, you've had adverse life events, you don't live in the right place, you're um, never going to be able to get over that. 
And that's a very different thing than when I first started, because when I first started, we really believed that people could change, that you could give people a leg up and a hand out, and that they would actually get on with their own lives, and that they should try and leave behind perhaps bad things that have happened, or the fact that they lived in a particular area, or that they had been, you know, in my case, brought up in a very backward, morally corrupt society with a huge religious implications. And so I think it's really, really negative. I see in the young people I work with now that they, they are almost told that there's nothing can be done about it, and their parents are told nothing can be done, and the parents are completely blamed for whatever the actual small issue might be for those young people. But when you turn that on its head, as we do in the, in the work I do, and we say, you're as good as anybody, you have a slight issue here that you need to get over, but you have to have hope, and you have to move on. And saying that it's ADHD, or ADD, or you're depressed, or you're addicted to you know, internet, or you're addicted to Facebook, or whatever, is really, really, neg it has really negative practical implications for each of those individual young people. And sending them off to be treated for addictions to Facebook or tweeting or whatever it might be, which is our latest thing about poor or young people, it's always something new. So now they're all addicted to all this stuff. Um, it's really unhelpful. And it doesn't give you a step up and a step out of that. Actually, we've all moved on in our lives. We all had adverse life events at some stage. And you get on with it. Being told that you're addicted to something doesn't actually help you. So I think the broader social context that Mike's talking about, us as professionals who work in it, is really, really dangerous. So we're teaching kids to cope that, you know, it's not really their fault and they should just, you know, God help them, they'll have to just try and get over this and maybe get a bit of neuroscience in the future. But in actual fact, what we should be telling them is that they should change the social, and political and economic circumstances in which they live which we no longer do at all. They just have to put up with that and go and get some, hope that somebody comes up with a drug in the future that will stop them using Facebook every day. In this kind of, so you guys idea of, of the medicalization of human distress um, and of the rush to kind of categorize you know, a new taxonomy of disorders. Um, it's not the case that with this, the recent re new edition of the American Classification of Psychiatric Disorders, whilst gambling it became part of the addictions kind of group. The other, the other addictions that were up for grabs, so sex and internet, were not. So I wanted to know if that could be something that Henry might like wish to explain. And the second question was just to wonder, is there some other way whereby it is possible to use clinical labels without that having the connotation of removing personal responsibility? I, see. I really want to emphasize the point of the final nail of neurodeterminism, I think. We, we need to really be careful in terms of how this way of lining, like how we're talking about really, I mean, we're talking about very serious addictions, but when we talk about sex addiction and about addiction to pornography, what about like addiction to pedophilia? And about how do we feel about this issue about like, oh, it's like, it's their past fault. It's like, it's because they've had a really difficult childhood. But at the same time, there's a lot of people out there that we're not giving credit to who have had difficult childhoods, who have been able to pull through it. And maybe these are the people we should be having centers of our studies. The issue of the neurodeterminism is really difficult and a really dangerous line. Is like, when are we going to say it's not, uh, I mean, we have this issue of gender determinism. And when I say like, well, people are certain ways because they're from, they're born a certain genetic way. It's like, actually it just removes entire personal responsibility. Yeah, I think there's a profound mischaracterization of <clears throat> the use of science in this area. That any attempt to militate scientific evidence of which there is uh, a growing body, that that would be dismissed as neurodeterminism. When I think, uh, the doctor said in any case, that we're talking about a heritable component, for instance. People jump straight to determinism and saying that they're deeply worried and uh, you know, we must kill Rasputin, nails in coffin, the final nails in coffin. It's a truth of human psychology that we fear almost more than anything, maybe than death itself, the loss of control, the fact that we might not be uh, controlled agents of our own behaviors. And this is indeed what so much science, you don't have to go anywhere near a brain scanner or even neuroscience itself. You can simply look at uh, behavioral psychology and uh, genetic correlates and, and, and actually physics uh, and general philosophy will tell you this. So I want to say for anyone listening that has an open mind, look at the science, examine it for yourselves. The, the uh, extreme uh, repugnance for what was immediately termed neurodeterminism without even 
you know, Raymond didn't even seem to want to address the subtlety of the, of the argument here. Look at it for yourself. Uh, make your own judgments. It simply cannot be the case that science will never be able to tell us anything about the precursors of human actions. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say, since these are going to be my last words here, is that we can combine all of this. I think that you know, we, ca we cannot ignore that science is trying to help at some level. Uh, if you think of schizophrenia and where we were with schizophrenia 30 years ago, now we know that if someone has two parents who are schizophrenics, they're so, so at risk of becoming schizophrenics themselves that people should watch out for them teach them about the illness and teach them to avoid taking any drugs because if they don't, they're very likely to contract the disease. If instead they look after themselves, they're absolutely likely to stay well. And I think, you know, we can apply this to the world of addiction at some level. So I don't think we're, you know, we're all speaking from different perspectives. It's absolutely fine to have a medical perspective that takes in neuroscience and the classification of diseases and still be very excited and interested in societal changes um, and leaving it up to the individual and the people around the individual to make big changes in teaching them how to be a stronger person and absolutely not give up just because they've ended up experiencing some adverse early life conditions. As you say, all of us experience adverse conditions at some point or other, and it's about learning how to overcome them. Some people may need a little bit of extra help, and things like cognitive behavioral therapy have been shown to help significantly, even in young people, to try and make them a bit stronger. So that was the first thing I wanted to say. Um, Internet addiction, the question to answer that, there wasn't enough scientific evidence. And I think one of the great things about the DSM-5 is that at least they're trying. And they're not just going to be influenced by people's people pressuring them or, um, you know, there's, yes, there's research from Asia on internet addiction, but there really isn't enough from America or Europe, so that's why it ended up in section three, which is like more research needed. Um, uh, I agree that we are at risk of over-medicalizing things, and so, you know, uh, it's very important to hear all, all, um, all points of view, and it, I'm delighted to be here hearing them, because most of the time I'm in my clinic, and all I do is talk to other doctors, so I love hearing your perspectives. Um, uh, someone talked about different levels of, uh, 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 in terms of earthquakes <laughs> and severity. Well, in the new classification, you have mild, moderate, and severe, and those are uh, diagnosed according to a set of uh, diagnostic criteria and you score one, two, or three, four, five, or whatever. So yes, there is a sort of more, uni there's a universal way of doing that if you so wish to do that. And lastly, from me, can you get addicted to treating uh, patients with addictions? <coughs> well, clearly I've been doing it for 20 years. I love it. I wouldn't do anything else. So the answer is yes. But there are hopefully no adverse consequences <laughs> to that. <laughs> Bill? Thanks. Um, I just think, want to say how much I've enjoyed your questions, actually. Um, the, the neuroscience death of debate which has sprung up in the audience, I'd just say it might be useful to characterise it really as neuroscience and genetics as well, as, as new kinds of knowledge rather than ones that are going to die. But they're in no sense mature enough or know enough to actually influence policy and our understanding of behaviour in any meaningful way. And, and some of my best friends are neuroscientists, so I'm not doing this um, um, just to... Um, this, the, um, the discipline, but the problem is that they're making claims too quick and they're trying to, um, there's a very interesting article about the, the colours they use on um, scans, brain scans, the, the, the colours that they, to try and emote and to, to cause fear and so on. Um, it's all representation at the moment and it needs much more knowledge before it can be useful. But I think in terms of the typologies question, um, I think that's very interesting too. And I think what really needs to be, and this relates in the sense to the issue about whether we can salvage some sense of self-determinism within the clinician vocabulary and approach as well. I think it's all about, A, it's up to the clinicians really to be aware of the, the much broader set of contexts in which they're working, um, which often many of them are, and, and we have, they've got a bit of a bashing today, but there's, I mean, everyone's doing their best. But there needs to be that sense of um, awareness of complexity and a precision in terms of differentiating between um, the kinds of focus that people become um, fervently disposed towards, um, the, the effects on the person as opposed to society, and a, a really strong 
differentiation between consequences and the context in which those consequences are experienced and actually the consequences for the individual as well. And these aren't always the same things, but they seem to be bundled together too often in, in treatment and also in policy. Um, and that ties in with the question from the back, which I, th I really agreed with about this, um, the self-fulfilling prophecy that therapy can actually provide for people rather than a determination to sort out the social and economic context in which people have to work. So I'll leave it there for now. Okay. Sally? Oh, yeah, I, I don't think anyone's a, a neuro nihilist. Um, but, you know, just from a practical standpoint, uh, at this time, and I suppose you always have to add that when you're talking about the implications of, of brain findings for <coughs> treatment and, and policy, although I'm skeptical about its relevance to the latter um, in any form. Nevertheless, um, it's just that when you think of, you know, the brain, let's say, brain, psychology, environment, um, this kind of thing, that, um, that if you're a uh, clinician or a policymaker, that the most effective interventions we have at this time reside at the levels of, of psychology, especially behavioral management. We didn't even talk about relapse prevention, but uh, there's a very... Uh, a good structured way of helping uh, people to recognize the kinds of uh, environmental cues that trigger craving, which is a very disruptive sensation and can really sabotage recovery. Um, but uh, you know these occur at the at the behavioral level, and we've also talked about the psychological level in terms of reasons why people use. I personally think that much addiction is driven by the self medication model but that people uh, it, it helps with d distress in, in some way. Um, but the point is that uh, you know when and if neuroscience has something to teach us that's of practical use, I'll be the first to, to use it. I certainly do believe that uh, the neuroscience of addiction will, I suspect, will tell us more in the end about motivational systems and reward, uh, reward processing and um, impulse control, and maybe more relevant, frankly, end up being more relevant for other mental conditions than addiction, but who knows, we'll, we'll have to see. The point is, I think we're all dying to use whatever's practical, it's just that, uh, that level of analysis has not yet produced anything, and it shouldn't be a distraction from the other uh, levels, behavior and, and psychological <clears throat> and environmental, which have the most uh, promise for informing policy and treatment. Um, I could end there. Yep, Shall I, I think end that's there? A, Okay, I'll end there. Uh, Frankie, and then Mike. Um, I'm going to just finish on the point that was raised in the front row about kind of increasing medicalization and I know that this discussion is about addiction but I think it kind of ties in further to the kind of medicalization of, of often quite normal or abnormal or bad bad behaviors depending on what your framework is I think the increasing use of the word depression um, to mean sadness or to mean fed up the increased use of its terminology within everyday parlance as well I think is something that we need to look at closely and as does Mike has alluded to why this is happening um, and you know what is this kind of creeping infantilization that has led us to kind of medicalize our normal behavior um, so that's why I'm going to leave it after Okay, and Mike. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to c conclude on this question, interesting question about doctors being addicted, can doctors be addicted to treating patients? Well, I thought it was a very interesting question. And uh, in a way, Henrietta's reply I thought was even more interesting because, you know, the problem of, not just peculiar to doctors, but there's, there is a vast professional world of doctors, therapists, nurses, people involved in caring and helping. It is a major sphere of activity in our society. And it's, it seems to me very important to recognise that, that the, and, and Henrietta started her, her comments by emphasising the degree of distress and suffering that, it, that she's dealing with in her clinic. But to, for anybody then to suggest, and she sort of suggests that, that, uh, that she uh, very much enjoys this work, but the, she considers that there could be no adverse consequences of this activity, is quite a remarkable uh, conviction to express because 
you've got to be aware personally, of the possibility. Per per well, personal personal advice. Personally, yes. yes. But, 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 you know, the, the, we have to be aware as professionals of the possibility of adverse consequences of our, our attempts to be caring and helpful. On That's myself the, when I treat people. I appreciate your emphasis was about adverse consequences On for me, yourself. Yeah. I'm talking about adverse consequences oh, for sure, the, sure. our patients and for uh, the wider public who are in these relationships of being helped and cared for by professionals. And it seems to me that one, can, one of the few things I learned from my long career in medicine was the importance of the adage, don't just do something, stand there, which is one of the great insights of evidence based medicine. Don't just do something, stand there. If you don't know what you're doing is going to help somebody, you're better off not doing anything. And so much of one of the great insights of evidence-based medicine has been to show that many of the things that doctors were doing actually were not just useless, but, but positively harmful. And, you know, this is one of the questions that we have to ask, it seems to me, in relation to our dealing with these problems, that we are dealing here with problems of living, uh, really. And doctors, I can, let me let you into a secret, doctors do not have any answers to the problems of living any more than you have. And the, there is a very serious danger in the presumption that pretends that they have some greater insight into this, and that, 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 that underlies their interventions in these sort of areas, which can indeed actually undermine people's capacity to deal with their own problems. And that's the thing I think we've got to be aware of in this area, that the very idea that we are doing, of being very caring and very helpful and responding to all these distress, that what we are actually doing may actually be undermining people's capacity to deal with the problems themselves. Okay, can we thank the panel, please? For